I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Aubrey Bergauer. She is the CEO of Changing the Narrative. In her experience, she has been working with classical music, and her hope was to change the narrative, change the way people used to do things into a more updated version where they can reach a broader audience. I know she's a speaker and a consultant too. I'd like to find out today how she's able to expand her expertise into other fields to help other companies reach a broader audience and do better in business. Join me in my conversation with Aubrey Bergauer. I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Aubrey Bergauer. Good, e- good evening, young lady. <laughs> good to be here. I am, I'm very happy to have you here. We were just chatting a moment ago, trying to, to get to know each other. So obviously, we do not know each other very well. And I'll do an introduction to you at the beginning, or they would have heard it by now. But can you fill us in a little bit better than I'm able to? Sure. My background is in classical music, and I have made my whole career about changing the paradigms within classical music. So for anybody listening to this, as soon as I said classical music, you probably had some stereotypes, which are not wrong, and jump into your head about what that means, what that music is like, what the concert experience is like, who the audience is. Um, And sadly, a lot of that is very true. And my whole career has been about how do we break that down? How do we rewrite what this music genre is and who we're serving and what we're all about? So in a nutshell, that's what I've done. Um, <laughs> and I've worked in all kinds of different arts organizations, really defying the trends of the industry. Aubrey, and I'd really like to get into this because I think it's going to be interesting in your career path that has led you up to this point. But what would have been your very first job, the very first, even as a teenager, something maybe it could have been related to classical music, but something that may have been totally unrelated, like selling lemonade or Mm. doing puppet shows or something for your friend? I definitely was like a lemonade stand kid. I feel like all like like that question prompts like my earliest memories of working are something very sales oriented so totally was the kid on the block like anybody having a garage sale I would be like yep let's get everybody together we're doing the lemonade stand and I was the delegator you know you bring the cooler of lemonade you get the cups Um, I'll bring some change so we can make change for people who don't have coins like that kind of thing so definitely early on one of those types of kids Um, how old how old would you have been around that age starting something oh gosh elementary school so maybe like I don't know second grade through fifth grade maybe I don't know that you're one of the youngest so far I mean a couple of people but that's really good I mean it's sh- that's what I like to show and you're asking me a moment ago about the audience it's it's to show people the drive that people had you know some people yeah. didn't have that drive as a young kid and it wasn't until later maybe they realized realized some responsibilities in life but it's pretty amazing great I mean I have a son who will be in grade two next year but like to imagine him like, Papa, I need, I'm going to go do this. You know, I'm going to organize people making money. And I mean, that's, that's a great thing. What, what was the drive? Where did that maybe come from? Even like grade two, three, four, five, where is that starting to. Yeah. To, I've to grow always, I've always been one that wants to like, like rally people around an idea and so somehow at a young age that manifested itself with like okay if the garage sale is happening down the street then let's get all those people channeled through this thing we've made called a lemonade stand so but I think that's what it's about it's always always like every memory I think about in terms of work and what's driving me has always been about moving a group of people Mm -hmm. forward in some way so besides these things that were more part-time and maybe more seasonal, did, what was your first official job? Maybe, obviously, <laughs> probably in your teens too. Gosh, let's see. Yeah, in, in my teens, what did I do? I worked for the school district one year. I, that was... Um, you were my, a teenager working for the school district. I know, you, believe you me. And I I know. Come, you can make come, fun of me all you want. <laughs> from totally to, no, not make fun. It's great. Like, I... Probably, I don't want to say I hated school, but the idea is you weren't going to find me working in school, you know, especially outside of the hours, regular school hours. But that's great. Yeah. 
I, I remember um, that was in high school and I remember knowing I wanted to pursue so, some sort of business opportunity. If, I think I wanted it to be in classical music, but I wasn't really sure at that point. Mm -hmm. And um, I got credit hours for doing it. So I got paid, but also yeah. got some course credit. It was like a mix of that. And so I was, uh, for me, I got to kill two birds with one stone, make some money and get some credit. You really had your ducks lined up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like you're, you're like getting type A to a fault. Yeah. You're getting paid in high school at school. <laughs> That's, yeah. When did, I guess, if you were thinking of classical school or classical education later on, even in high school, where did the, the bug of music start for you? Where, when did you start getting into maybe even playing music? Yeah, so I played an instrument all growing up and I, I grew up in Houston, Texas. I played in the Houston Youth Symphony and I loved it. I loved playing. But the, the, that moment for me where it really opened things up was when the youth orchestra went through an executive director change. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, the music director is normally the person waving the baton, but the executive director is most often behind the scenes doing the business side of things. And they didn't say a lot to us kids in the orchestra about that. They, I just remember there was a change in this position and they introduced this new person to us before rehearsal one day. And that was enough for me to realize, oh, there's a job that's off stage mm -hmm. that's managing this entire operation. And that sound like the lemonade stand kid in me was mm -hmm. like, that sounds like what I want to do. And so music could be a really important part of my life, but I'm not performing for the rest of my life. What instrument were you playing? I played the tuba, believe it or not. I don't look like <laughs> a tuba player for anybody listening, but I loved it. Now, who was that your first instrument, the tuba? Yeah. yeah. And when I was little, I had to sit on phone books just so I could like reach the mouthpiece. What made you decide to choose? I mean, we have a daughter as well. And so our son is playing, the both of them are playing violin and piano, but I think it was probably more of us, the push. Where did the push come for just, I mean, <laughs> literally picking up the tuba? I was talked into it is the yeah. honest answer. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I remember going to our middle school, like in fifth grade, before sixth grade, you get to go like sign up for what instrument you're going to play if you're going to yeah. join the band. And uh, I wanted to play the saxophone. I thought that was like the coolest instrument in the universe. I thought jazz was awesome. I, I don't know, I just thought it was super cool. And I picked up the saxophone in, in grade six and I lasted two weeks. And then All I, right. You know, yeah. My, See, my mom was not very impressed. <laughs> no, no. Two weeks I lasted. That was it. Oh gosh. So I go to sign up for this and the band director says, mm, your mouth isn't right, which translation means too many kids signed up for this already. Pick something else. Uh, and so I start crying on the spot. I, that like, must be a difficult broken. position. That must be a very difficult position for a music teacher. I mean, they're managing as you're like intertwining in a lot of all yeah. that you're saying is, okay, there's this group, <laughs> this number of people that want this instrument and you had a dream or desire or passion. They're like, ah, no, can you do this? That must be yeah. a hard position for a music teacher or anyone in those types of positions. Yeah, I'm sure. I th yeah, looking at it now in hindsight, I see yeah. that in the moment, I just was devastated. You were but, crushed. Um, but I remember the band teacher saying, you know, we, we, you look like a brass player. This look like you can play something is just so bogus. But anyways, you look <laughs> like a, a brass tuba. player. Yeah, exactly. Here you go. And I remember them saying, like, are you responsible? Can you handle a school-owned instrument? <laughs> I was just like wiping one. tears from my eyes, like, whatever, I'm it, sure. And that's how it started. So it started mm, maybe not the best day of my life, but, uh, but very quickly I realized, uh, and this is true to my personality too, like, oh, I'm the, the girl tuba player among all the guys. And then the competitive person in me really came out and I was like one of the best tuba player of, the, your, of all the guys. On your and phone so, books, yes. Yeah, I was sitting on my phone books trying very hard and practicing quite a lot. And then, I, and then from there I really enjoyed it and it became this serious threat in my life. So for, with the tuba, we're, were you learning classical music right away? I mean, not right away, but you're learning scales and all of that. But was yeah. that the, the bent that you took right away? Yeah, I remember, I mean, I loved the middle school band that would like any, just playing any kind of music. You know, at that yeah. age, it's like cover songs and pop songs and, yeah. some, and maybe some more like sort of traditional band mm -hmm. music. And then 
by high school is when things really started becoming more clear. Uh, first of all, I hated marching band, like did not want to walk around carrying. Did you do band. it? I did it my freshman year and then decided, uh, uh-uh, this is not, <laughs> not happening. Uh, so marching so, band is tough. I mean, for the yeah, it's easiest, even if, you, even if dedication. you have like a trumpet or something, I'd, I'm well, even a, a saxophone or a snare drum, something know, small, anything, anything else. It's, here, hard. Yeah. it's very hard. Yeah. So I, so there was that piece, just the physical aspect that I was like, that's not, I like making music. I'm not here to like march around carrying this big thing. And then simultaneously at that point, I I had won that audition for the Houston Youth Symphony was being exposed to more music with the full orchestra and realizing, Mm -hmm. oh yeah, this is like being a part of a big ensemble sitting in a chair, not marching around. (laughs) I, I, I just liked that so much more. Was there anyone in your family that was musical as well? Or was this just your own thing and something new for your family? Not seriously musical. My yeah. parents both played instruments growing up, but never super seriously. Uh, but some of my earliest memories are my dad's record collection. And he would play all kinds of music, everything from you know Michael Jackson as a child of the 80s to yeah. Stravinsky's Firebird. And I remember like the dichotomy of all that music being played. And so classical music, and all genres of music were in my life from early on in that way. So I know you went on to Rice University. So how did that, how did you define, I mean, you had your ducks lined up, so you were probably thinking well in advance, you might've scouted out some schools, maybe someone has scouted out you. How did, how did that process work for you? I had decided at that point, I'd already had that moment of, wow, there's a job managing the orchestra really inspired and and captivated by that idea. And so for me, I wanted to go to a place where I could pursue business as well as pursue music, knowing that I wanted to put those two ideas together for a career. So a lot of times in the performing arts, especially in classical music, you go to a a conservatory where you're just training for that instrument only. And for me, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this whole business training as well. So uh, Rice is one of a a handful of schools that has an excellent music program, but also really excellent, truly excellent academics. And I thought, well, if I can do both of those things at a great school, wow, that did my mind, my like, you know, 16, 17 year old mind as I was sorting out applying um, and applying for college, I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. And so I, I got in, I passed the audition on the music side. I was admitted academically. And for me, that was a real, um, a real just banner milestone accomplishment. So as you were finishing university, did you start applying for jobs and something in particular? I know you're in California now. Is that something where a place where you wanted to be? Or did you, were you that forward looking into your career already? Yeah, California comes later for sure. But out of school, I was applying for entry level jobs at orchestras. And my first job ended up being in Seattle at the Seattle Symphony. And uh, after graduating, I was really lucky I got got a job at this great orchestra. And that first job out of college was working with all the donors. So I did all of the donor events and what we call donor stewardship, like thanking them for their gift and here's a cocktail party and those sorts of things. And it was a good job in that I learned a lot about fundraising. I learned a lot about working with donors. I learned a lot about um, all the different types of donors from individuals to corporations to uh, foundations. And so that, that was my first job. It was, I was, very lucky to be able to do what I had sought to do with my education. Aubrey, on a side note, could you speak of the process of maybe even out of university or just before finishing applying for jobs? I mean, how many jobs did you apply for? Or how nervous were you on the interviews? That sort of stuff yeah. to, to land start in, as you start to plot your career. I definitely applied for a handful of jobs. I... I knew I wanted to work for an orchestra. I didn't, where I did not have clarity is what within that. I remember the Seattle Symphony asking me, well, you're fresh out of college. What do you want to do? And I remember thinking, I want a job. (laughs) 
you know? And so that's where I didn't have clarity and I, and where I think music schools can do a better job today, sort of helping students understand the spectrum of opportunity available. Um, so I just share that to say, that's what I was lacking then yeah. for sure. Um, you know, do you want to do marketing? Do you want to do fundraising? Do you want to do artistic planning, operations, production, finances? And I was just like, uh, anything, whatever you have open, that, that's what I want to do. Yeah. So I, um, I was able to leverage my teeny tiny network at that time. And one of the teachers that I had at Rice who, who played in the Houston Symphony knew somebody who had later gone on to work in Seattle. And so sure enough, even right out of college, like the network and who you knew mm -hmm. really mattered for me. And that was, that was enough that with my lack of clarity on what I wanted to do, I was able to get my foot in the door for an interview and say, you know, I'm here to learn. This is what I want to do with my, for my life's work, whatever you have, I, I want to help with. And so that was that naivety <laughs> combined uh, with networking was enough to help me get get that first job yeah maybe i don't know naive but you you had the wherewithal to know you were brave enough you were courageous enough even though you felt you lacked some of the clarity necessary to define what it is you wanted to do but you still put that forward the foot forward you put out a resume you were willing to put yourself out there for an interview and you were willing to to grab hold of a dream or a passion that you had despite and i think that's it, it's a good encouragement for people cuz not everyone has that clarity and usually i mean you were pretty clear in growing up but it wasn't truly defined but a lot of people are similar to that even if they don't have the same clarity you had as a teenager being business oriented and music oriented and you pursued that all the way to today but I think it's a great encouragement for people to know that even if you're not quite sure, but you have a little idea of what it is you want to do, get out there and do it. And then you can leverage some of the, the networking opportunities you have. Or if you don't have any and you just stumble into a position, you can learn on the job if they're so willing to give you that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, having clarity, it's a blessing and a curse in that way. Like I was so laser focused on what I thought my end goal, mm -hmm. what I wanted, but then to reverse engineer that to what do I do is my first step out of college. It was a little bit, I don't know, like applying to the right places. I want to work at an orchestra, but then as we said, within that, what does that look like and having to kind of figure that out. So yeah, I love what you're saying that that's okay. And there's so much opportunity to try and see how it goes and that's a good way to learn in my opinion well because a lot of people would sit back on their heels and say well I, you know i don't have the confidence i don't have the knowledge i don't have the education i don't and some of those things can be attained more easily than others but not to lean back to press forward because in many respects a lot of people respect that even if you're lacking that clarity at, you're willing to put yourself out there Bringing yourself today to today in what you do, what, what, how did you get there specifically? And what is it that you do each day? And maybe even with COVID might be changing some things up for you. Yeah. So the next steps for me after that job at Seattle Symphony was, I, I learned, talking about learning, I learned pretty quickly fundraising isn't my favorite. I learned a lot. It's tough. Love loved hanging with the donors but yeah. but knew like okay aubrey and i really started thinking okay what's next what else Wait, we, what sorry else? aubrey what did you not like about the fundraising hmm. because and it gives people some clarity because it's not yeah. hard right no matter how like getting money getting donors getting support going back like it's for people who have never experienced it it's a grind it's a grind i think that's maybe the best way to put it is that it really is and i think also at the time there was definitely um there's a big age difference from somebody who had recently graduated from college to working with major donors and and you know later in life a lot of people have much more income and so it tended to be that donors and especially donors to an orchestra skewed much older so that alone made just um uh i really i had to talk about like work it felt like such work to converse with donors if i'm talking to somebody in their 70s or 80s and we shared an interest in classical music so thank goodness i was well versed in how to talk about that but that relationships are such an important part of fundraising that i think at the time that age difference was was really challenging um so combine that with the grind of you know you, you secure a gift or in my case plan a successful event 
And then it's like immediately onto the next. Okay, where are we gonna get the next gift? Who's that coming from? Which donor are we cultivating right now? And so it, it, grind really is the perfect word because it just, it's endless. And I don't hate it. It was enough to know that, okay, if I'm going to be a CEO of a major orchestra someday, Aubrey, you need fundraising chops. So I'm glad that that was a first experience. But I think those are the reasons why I thought, okay, what's next? What are the other tools I need in my chest if I'm going to advance to that big job? Fundraising reminds me, I, I did a, a resident manager job maintaining an apartment building and everyone was perfectly fine with me. Um, we had good relationships uh, until someone fell behind in rent mm -hmm. and then having to go and ask for money. I mean, you're, there's that, that money thing with people too. It's like, they okay, here comes Aubrey. Here comes Aubrey. She wants money. In the back of the mind, right? And that's that's a hard, you know, mountain to get over. And not only that, you had a passion for music and you had this business expertise growing inside you and just wanting, you know, and it's something you really believed in, but you're you're asking for something from these people. And and that was probably, I mean, for me, it it changed the relationship with the people that I thought I had a pretty good relationship with. And it really crushed my soul to, I mean, asking for rent that's overdue is a little different than asking for gifts for, you know, the things that they share a passion in, but there's still a different dynamic to asking for something from someone. Um, and, and it's, it's hard. And then you got to do it again and again. Again and again. Yeah, exactly. Which eventually you grow a very thick skin, which it was good training and learning for me. Um, <laughs> but to the question of the path after that, yeah. uh, Seattle Opera called and they said, we want your event planning experience to run our Young Patrons Club. Are you interested? So talk about everything I just mentioned with yep. age difference, like liking some of the parts of the events themselves were fine. And then being able to uh, channel that into an opportunity that was okay for opera goers in their 20s yep. and 30s. All right, mm -hmm. these are my people. Yeah. Um, uh, planning events around the opera that help educate uh, what's going to be on stage and whether that's a party or more of a traditional like lecture or sort of type of event I thought yes okay this is great uh, the young patrons club had a junior board so with my you know future looking hat on I thought yes I need experience with the board even if it's a junior board if ultimately I want to be working with yeah the big board quote unquote so all those things oh and it was run through the marketing department and I thought okay now let's try some try my hand at marketing so I can add those skills to my uh to my wheelhouse so went to Seattle Opera ended up staying there for several years um with increasing responsibilities it was one of those jobs that really uh evolved as I was there and I grew up more and at the time that's when digital marketing was sort of coming to the forefront mm -hmm. and social media was coming to the forefront and that's where my age benefited me because I was the kid in the office saying, we need a presence on social media. Let me start. Can I start that for us? And I've learned how do we can track digital ads so we can try this new vehicle for advertising so that maybe we're reaching different people than the people who are reading the newspaper every week. And was, I... Was there any grumblers? Do you remember yes, any grumblers? Yes, I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't want to do that. I'm going to spend the money on that. Spot. The that, that right there is like my whole career in the arts, Brian. Like everybody, like I'm trying to push the envelope. I'm trying to do some new things and everybody's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. For centuries, we've done it this other way. <laughs> so, so yes, totally that happened. And, but I, but that's when I learned that um, being data driven is very helpful because then it's not just, Aubrey squawk squawk opinion, squawk yeah. what I think we should do it's no look this is measurable and we can track the success from this and that was true on both those mediums digital advertising and social media and so from there I was able to get the buy-in because I was able to it would have been you know, nice putting, yeah to be in, in a room with you and you're like here's the numbers Oh, some of the people like well, they like the numbers. They they can be convinced by the numbers. Oh, not. absolutely, and that's something I use to this day. I've become so data driven, and in, and especially in the arts, where so much of it is subjective. Like we evaluate art very subjectively, whether that's classical music or a painting on the wall at a museum. Like right, art is in or beauty is in the eye of the beholder, mm -hmm. except it, well, except when it comes to doing the business. And I'm like, no, 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 no. 
here are the numbers, here's what they say, let's look at that. And that has been uh, a real driving factor from that point on my, in my career forward. So you were there for a few years and then when did you yeah. hunker down where you are? Let's see. So um, from there I went on, there was a local music festival, the Bumbershoot Music Festival, outside of classical music. I was brought on as the marketing director, so some career advancement there. And then eventually number two, overall revenue, contributed revenue. They did a lot of corporate sponsorships as well as the marketing and ticket sales. And then finally in 2014, uh, I moved to California and this was like personal converging with work. And yeah. that was, um, I was married by that time. My husband's in tech. So with him in tech, me in the arts, we'd always sort of had our eye on San Francisco. And mm -hmm. in 2014, both of us thought, you know, what's next for us? What's next after Seattle? And we both just decided, let's, let's start looking and see how this goes. So sure enough, he landed at a tech company. I was looking at the big arts organizations in San Francisco, San Francisco Symphony, the opera, applying for sort of at that point, middle to senior-ish management jobs. And then an orchestra just outside the city, about 20 miles east, called, uh, the recruiter called me, and they said, we're the California Symphony, we're looking for a new executive director. We're smaller than those other organizations you're looking at, but we want your experience from those big organizations in Seattle to come here and help us, we need the help. Aubrey, and, can you, sorry, can you speak of your, your confidence level at this point? Because now you have a number of years of experience. Yeah. You know, you weren't the same girl coming out of university, yeah. right? You have a lot more clarity. You, you received and you did well in the, the roles that you were in. And then you and your husband are moving to California and you're kind of picking what you want. Can you speak to how the experience and, and, you know, the courage or the determination, the dedication to your work and your craft helped you get to that level of confidence? Yeah, thanks for articulating that because you're right. If there's a real shift at the point when a recruiter calls you and says, we want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And definitely at that point i i was able to draw on confidence rooted in my prior experience and i remember saying to the recruiter and then eventually the board as i was going through the interview process talk about confidence i remember saying look <laughs> i have a lot of ideas about classical music and what needs to change oh. so if you bring me here you have got to buckle up and be ready for that are you ready for that? Do you want change? Because so many arts organizations say, we need change, we want younger mm -hmm. audiences, but yet tr truthfully are very reticent to do anything differently. And I remember the board saying, no, like, they were in the midst of a financial crisis. They were like, things are so bad. We know we have to do it differently. Mm -hmm. Otherwise we will not survive. And I thought, all right. Isn't that a nice feeling though, of that confidence of, I don't know if it was the explanation you used, uh, exclamation of look, but to be sitting, people dread interviews, right? I, I don't dread interviews anymore, right? Maybe I used to out of university or something even younger, but when you, when you have the experience, you have the knowledge, you know what you know, and you can look at them and actually be interviewing them and turn the table around. Isn't that a great feeling? It's a great feeling. And I feel like, I remember receiving that advice early on, you know, well, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. And that's true. But I think when it, I don't know, at some point mentally something switched for me mm -hmm. of no Aubrey, be, get serious about interviewing them and what do they have to say? Like at some point I realized, no, it makes a difference in my yeah. own happiness and fulfillment. So get with it, Aubrey, and how much you're, you're interviewing them as well. So yeah, I love that you said that. Well, it's, you, they always ask, you know, do you have any questions? And a lot of people don't have any <laughs> questions, but you should turn it around and, and see really what they offer you and what value they can bring to your life. Because Hopefully your plan is to stay with them for a number of years, which means a exactly. lot of investment time, invested time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And in this case, I knew it was going to be a turnaround situation. And I thought, Aubrey, you got to learn the dirt. You got to learn it now because you will learn it later and you don't want it to be surprised. You want to know it now and you want that 
buy-in from the board now so that you can do the things that you want to do that at that point I had been like cogitating in my mind for a decade prior thinking okay this is this is what's broken about classical music and this is what I want to do to try to address it so are you able to I mean even at a young age when you saw some changes in high school but are you were you when were you able to define the real core problems with classical music Mm. some of the problems I think I observed all the way back going to high school. I, yeah. For example, I remember my first experiences in Houston, my hometown at the Houston Symphony, at the Houston Grand Opera. And even as somebody who was a teenager seriously pursuing music, I because I did not come from a super serious musical family, I didn't know all of the unspoken expectations and rules at a performance, for example. So I didn't know at my first time when I went I think my first time at the Houston Symphony, I was in elementary school and I didn't know when to applaud or not when to applaud. Mm -hmm. So things like that. And um, I didn't know even just like how long each piece of music was going to be. Now I know there's a very standard format of like a 10 minute overture, a 20 minute concerto and a 45 minute symphonic work. No orchestra prints that anywhere on their program mm -hmm. except the California Symphony. So, <laughs> um, so those kinds of things and those moments early on um, made me realize, and those are just a few examples, but yeah. there are so many things that, that professional, classical music organizations really assume the audience knows. And the reality is very few people in life are music majors. Very few people in life have that sort of baseline education that the organization is assuming they have. And especially in America with the decline in public music education, yeah. fewer and fewer people do have a baseline understanding of classical music. And so I had been putting all of that together like since high school, as you said, and and then seeing that play out in my jobs at Seattle Symphony and Seattle Opera, and then coming to the California Symphony finally as executive director where I can make organization-wide change to say, no, we will think about our customer in a way that we know most of them are new. And we know, like the loyal people, they're gonna stay. They're, all, they're loyal, they're in. But the new people that come, those are the people that we really want to make sure they have a welcoming and inviting experience because otherwise they won't come back. And there's all kinds of statistics and classical music about that. And those are the types of trends we really started bucking. I, from my layman's perspective, I can just imagine half of the people in the audience are uneducated, unaware, ignorant to many things just because they were probably dragged there. <laughs> Yeah, not all. I mean, not always, but there's a lot of people that really have no idea about all the workings of classical music. Yeah, and not only well, that, drag there or not, I think most people don't know. And I yeah. think what's interesting is, you know, a lot of people who go to the symphony are very smart, culturally aware people. Like they go to other live performances, Broadway or whatever, musicals or that kind of thing, yeah. uh, or just like shows in clubs or like they like music or smart or educated yet this one very niche genre is not familiar to them and anyways it just drives me nuts when orchestras assume that it everybody should know everything and i'm like why why are we assuming that that's talk about this is why we get labeled as elitist everybody yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in your position now in the california symphony from the last six years i would take it Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is what is some? I mean, even in the interview, they said they were in a in, in a financial crisis or they're in a pretty bad situation. How have you helped bring them up to speed? And maybe some highlights along the way. Yeah. So, um, quick correction: I was there five years. It's just left now. about a year or so ago to to do consulting for other orchestras. Yes. But in those five years we doubled our audience we nearly quadrupled the donor base we diversified our audience that's a huge problem in classical music mm -hmm. so we were able to achieve talk about being data driven achieve all these metrics that really defy the trends of the industry in terms of first-time concert goers then the national statistic for orchestras in the united states is that 90 percent of first-time attendees never come back and we were able to to change that. So if 90% never come back, that's a horrifying number in my opinion. Yeah. That means 10% are the ones who do. We were able to get that retention rate from 10% to 30%. So 3X the national yeah. average. And you start compounding that if every concert has a 3X return rate, 
that starts really building a virtuous cycle in terms of then those repeat buyers become our top prospects for season ticket holders. So we were able to really grow our season ticket holder base. Season ticket holders are the top prospects for donors. So we, that's how we were able to really significantly increase our donor base. So the through line of all these different jobs and wow, that fundraising experience, that marketing experience, that focus on the customer and what are they experiencing their first time there, putting that all together is really what led to the success of the organization. How through that, you know, five year path and mission that you had for that company, what was, I don't want to say the hardest part, but I'm just, I was thinking of a horse. Like if you let a horse go, they're going to run free, like, and not aligning you with being a horse, but I can imagine with all your skills and your talents that if they gave you the freedom to do what you wanted, then you were able to accomplish these things along with, you know, some help of other people. How, how easily were you able to change the landscape of the company and allow those things to happen versus what was a difficulty kind of slowing you or was that the same curmudgeon in the background and uh, we're not going to, what, how did that transition for you? So much was covered in that interview process. So I'm glad we talked about that of just being sure that upfront I had the buy-in I needed, because like I said, a lot of orchestras do not want that kind of change, but I Mm -hmm. made sure in advance that this board was ready for it. Mm -hmm. So I always say now the silver lining of crisis at an arts organization is that there is more of an appetite for change and to do things differently. Mm -hmm. So that was good. Uh, The second thing that helped is being so numbers driven data driven because i it was the same thing that i experienced at all those other jobs and mm-hmm. like back to being that like mid 20 something at seattle opera where i would go to board meetings and it wasn't just aubrey's ideas it was this is what the data is showing this is the national no return rate this is how we're moving the needle on our retention and these are good numbers and then at the end of the day it's okay how much money did we bring in in ticket sales and in donations and being able to show that oh yeah it's working that matters and so then the board you know it's building that trust with the board and they're saying oh yeah the the proof is in the pudding it's there and the money that we're making and we're balancing the budget and then from there that cycle just really became more and more virtuous and there's always somebody there's always somebody who says well what about you know xyz or or what about um we ended up telling people applaud whenever you like what you hear and there's always somebody even to this day as i'm giving talks on this around the country, somebody's saying, well, what does the core audience think? Or what does that stodgy long-term board member think? And yes, there is always that person for sure. And my response to that is always, it's twofold. First of all, like I said this before, the loyal people, they're very loyal in classical mm-hmm. music. Once somebody's in for several years, they're really, really in. So that's mm-hmm. good. Two, my entire time at California Symphony, I had, uh, only one person really threatened to leave. Like if you tell people to clap when they like what they hear and whenever they want one more time, I'm not renewing my subscription that I've had for the last 20 years. Well, guess what? You heard me say we doubled the audience. So I will take that trade of one person who leaves <laughs> doubling the audience any day of the week. And that's mm-hmm. always my answer of yeah. it goes back to the numbers and I, I just won't succumb to a one or two cranky naysayers. So you had so much success, but you also, and you said the proof was in the pudding, but the proof was obviously in the pudding for you to leave too. So Mm. with so much success, when did you start seeing it was maybe time for you to transition into, I'm guessing changing the narrative, is that what you changed? Exactly, exactly. So somewhere along the way in all of this, I started blogging about it. I think it was 2016 when I started, been there two years when I started blogging about the successes. And after three more years, really, I had seen, okay, I want to have an impact on the field. I want to have an impact beyond one organization. And I had sort of developed organically this side hustle of being called for advice somewhere along the way. I started charging for it and nobody blinked an eye. I was getting contacted (laughs) for more speaking engagements. Do you, you, I mean, you you were successful at this point anyway, but when you first charged to speak, were you pleasantly surprised? A little shocked? Were you like, yeah, hmm. yeah, exactly. I thought, well, 
okay. And the first time I did, it was on a, an opportunity that I, I felt comfortable, take it or leave it. You know, maybe they'll get mad and say no. And so, you know, it was talk, going back to confidence, trying to wait until an opportunity I felt confident enough that either outcome was okay with me. But no, sure enough, they were like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Honey. <laughs> Yeah. We got so, something good here, yeah. Exactly. So all of that started coming together. And so in 2019, I made the plan of, okay, I think I'm going to make the leap to, I think there's a market for this, definitely a need in classical music to continue to change the narrative that that was the name of my blog. It's now the name of my company and uh, offering those consulting services for orchestras, opera companies, um, work with a few nonprofits outside the arts. That's always a pleasant surprise when somebody outside the arts says, you know, this applies to us here too. And I'm like, cool, let's talk yeah. about it. So that's what I'm doing now for the last year or so I've been doing this on a, on a bigger scale. Could you, yeah, the, you can help a lot of businesses. It's not, right? It's not just yeah. classical music. So can you see or even comment on where you might be able to help listeners, help listeners on their business models and things that they're doing? Gosh, yeah. Let's see. A, a lot how of you see that, I mean, progressing, because you're only a year in, so how you're going to see that to be able to branch out into wherever you feel comfortable? Mm -hmm. Let's see. For example, I've gotten calls from a few media companies who are saying what we're experiencing with journalism and the consumption of media is not unlike what's happening in classical music. So that's been very interesting to work with those organizations and companies that have called. NPR called one day, same kind of thing. They said, we need an audience journey the way you did at California Symphony for our listeners, from listener or reader or what, you know, there's a lot of different ways they produce content there. Yeah. But how do we, what's that journey to ultimately donor? That's different than just like the fun drive in the car, because that's how they primarily raise a lot of money. So that was fascinating to be able to apply some of these things to that model um yeah i think media is the one i think most closely aligns every once in a while um let's see more schools and education systems yeah, like call a me. lot of businesses yeah. any sort of business to transition from the old way as you said at the beginning yeah. the old way of doing things to mm -hmm. a more data-driven social media um, experience that millennials even older people are getting into regardless of the oh, business yeah. it you have to give especially a talk a speech on how people can transition in this new way of doing business like mm -hmm. whether you're getting the calls yet they will be coming for a lot of other businesses as well i love that thank you i sure hope so <laughs> well, well even what i was thinking is how great like it's COVID is unfortunate but I couldn't imagine the symphony, symphony doing so well now in 2020. Mm -hmm. And this is giving you a great opportunity because another, if it's symphonies or if it's other businesses, they're going to use this wise ones. I mean, or if they're not wise to do so, maybe you should call a couple and tell them, hey, maybe you should take this time out to revamp your whole way of doing business because it's kind of like everyone's given a mulligan in 2020 to some degree to start over and then right. using your expertise. But if I was you, I, I would think it quite a for, it quite fortunate of, for you not to have been in that field now and starting, you know, your own business or now being a year in and, and gaining some traction in helping these companies who will definitely need your help in the future. Yeah, that's a great observation. I think, and I have said many times over the last <laughs> several months of the pandemic, wow, it would be really tough to be running an orchestra right now. Um, but I also agree with what you said, that this is an opportunity to, um, for somebody who talks about change a lot, it's an opportunity that the disruption that the pandemic has caused mm -hmm. is an opportunity to really, it's, I mean, it's completely disrupted and decimated the normal way of doing business. Therefore, how do we leverage that and design processes and systems and a way forward that doesn't look like the past. So for me, as somebody who prides herself on change, yes, this has been very, um, it's, it's provided opportunities that, of course, yeah. none of us wanted or saw coming, yeah. but I believe the opportunity is there. Can you explain maybe, I'm just thinking of 
how you're changing the landscape of classical music and some sort of satisfaction that you're able to get out of it. I, I can just think of, I don't know, I, I don't want to pigeonhole people, but some husband comes up to you and says, you know what, I never really enjoyed classical music until I came here or something along those lines where you can see some of the fruits of your labor. Yeah, there are those moments for sure where you, you, know, you hear from an audience member and it's just that story you said of, wow, I didn't think this was for me. And I just got season tickets because I loved it so much or, you know, those kind of stories. Uh, I also think on a broader scale, coming, especially taking an organization from crisis of, yeah. you know, half sold houses, uh, half full audiences. Mm -hmm. And then over time, selling everything out so much so that we had to add more performances to accommodate the demand. That's a story almost no orchestra gets to tell. So talk about changing the narrative. It's a very different narrative. And so those kind of moments where I remember thinking, wow, how far we've come and we're serving more people than we ever did before. And the, I think, I don't know, I think of those moments and are really filled with pride. And then also very gratifying is, is now when I'm getting the calls from others saying, Aubrey, I saw what you all did there. And I want that for my organization too can you help us do that? Like that is so gratifying to know that yes, all of this absolutely is replicable. All of it scales. I've worked at organizations of all sizes, so I see how it scales up and down. So yeah, to answer your question, I think those are the different moments where I think this is really awesome. It's, you're doing a great job of painting the picture of what people don't usually see. And that's why I appreciate people of all talents and all abilities. And I would hope more people would see the jobs that are not seen, the behind the scenes type of things. So I can imagine you, I don't know if you do it or not, but if you're at a concert and this is a company you're working for or someone that you've helped transform and the show's going on and there's, you know, double the capacity or double whatever was there before and you're not watching the concert but you're sitting arms, you know, standing arms crossed looking up and you and some other person like, yeah, we're doing it, right? Because you're behind the scenes and you're, it's like you noticed when you were in high school, there's another job. There's something else behind mm -hmm. going along the way that most people don't acknowledge. I think people, as you said, if they're wise people, they know it, but it's not something you think of. All the behind stuff, the people that are dedicated and working hard, obviously. And I think you're doing a really good job with painting that picture and letting people know and realize that, maybe there's another career for them that they never even thought of. Yeah, that is definitely a goal of mine. I, I say all the time, I say a couple of things all the time. One is I say we need our offstage talent to match our onstage talent. So often that's the path. You're trained as a musician to play in an orchestra. And the reality is, as we've discovered through our conversation, there's so many other opportunities. So I want our offstage talent to match our onstage talent. Yeah. And I also say that the, there is a full spectrum of opportunities in, in all of music, not even just classical music. Yeah. And so I am on a, uh, part of my personal mission is to help open that up. So I'm really happy that that came through. Speaking of your personal mission, what would you like people to understand about you? And the work that you're trying to accomplish, and maybe it's a, it's a goal, a lifelong goal of in, within musical, um, within classical music, or just something even a little bit broader. What is something you'd like people to know and appreciate about you a little bit more? I would say, I mean, my whole tagline and now business is changing the narrative, but I think in terms of classical music, I believe that success is achievable. And that in itself is sort of odd within classical music. We, we're an industry that sort of likes to tout our challenges and demise to not to be too dark about it, but, mm -hmm. um, but I don't believe that narrative. I believe that there is a better way. I believe that growth is possible. I believe that uh, the art form is not at all dead, that it is living and has so much more to give and offer and explore and that it can be fun. A lot of people do not use the word fun in a sentence with classical music, that it can be entertainment. So I believe all of these things. I think I want people to, to know that about me and to like roll all that up. I would say it's sort of a movement. It feels that way a little bit of mm -hmm. like, this is something we really are trying to get 
like mm -hmm. the ball rolling a bandwagon going on and that kind of change so i don't know if that will ever be achieved that sort of broad mm -hmm. no but it's a whole yeah change. no it's and it, i think you're doing a good job in especially thinking from a young age you've been doing it. it's kind of been a pretty straight mission for you um, and I think as more people hear about you and the work that you're doing um, and listen to classical music, that you have a hand in that. It's, it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Aubrey, what is something that you use? Maybe a tool. I mean, I don't think it's your tuba nowadays, but a tool that you use that helps you stay efficient in the work that you do. Oh, gosh. Uh, this is very specific, but yeah. I love the To Do app. Uh, Microsoft to do and before that it was a big Wonderlist fan but like yeah. that for me is like keeps me so organized and like yeah. moving around whether it's like daily priorities yeah. or like big idea brainstorms I just use it for a lot of things I didn't so. hear of that one yet it's a couple of people mentioned Trello is it um, oh yeah I, yeah yeah I use Trello some things like that but mm -hmm. to do I didn't hear about the to do app it's, I mean it seemed like it was an obvious thing to make for someone to do but <laughs> the to do app how do you um, make your life choices your balance and keep them in check your work life choices of separating work i mean you're a very busy lady you and not only that you are married and you have a life how do you turn off work and then enjoy whatever it else you may do this is a tough one i am not gonna lie i my husband would probably make a joke that i do not turn off work uh so that is that is true about me but i think part of it though is i have found work that is so core to who i am that is so yeah. like it's so deeply personal yeah. that that's the key that it is personal it's yeah. not separated professional yeah. and, prof and personal so so I, I am wired that way and, and i've chosen that but i do think i will say the caveat to that that i have definitely tried to be better about self-care and getting mm -hmm. enough sleep and like those mm -hmm. like healthy choices matter yep. within yep. me saying that that i love what i do so hopefully i don't know something in there hopefully resonates no it's good thinking of my audience do you have a tip for people getting into work i mean thinking of the spirit that you had as a young girl with a lemonade stand and organizing people in your neighborhood and then working your way up and through to where you are people getting into work at a young age or changing their career, do you have some sort of tip or some advice for them? I think I mentioned before, it was a blessing and a curse to have great clarity. And what I realize now is that I had clarity on the what, but I did not have clarity on the why. And it wasn't until several years into my career that I really started poking at that and questioning that of, Aubrey, why does the title of CEO of an orchestra matter to you? And once I started unpacking that, um, that also is the difference between me liking my work so much too, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. I, it was before that it was very transactional. And once I started realizing what's driving me, that yes, those entrepreneurial moments of the lemonade standard, that part of me and what is behind all that so learning the why this is a very simon cynic sounding answer i guess but like find your why but those things that are um just so core to who we are that are driving us getting at that makes every other choice so much easier value systems the jobs i'm interested in or not interested in the types of organizations i want to work with or not so for me that was a game changer that um that i wish i would have pursued early on because i just didn't have clarity on it for several years you mentioned the title and wondering why it's so important to have that can you go through the, the temptation and maybe you don't have it of putting your title like this is who i am so your career first mm -hmm. over over your character so making sure you're you're being a person of integrity all the way through regardless of uh, the title that you have or the career that you hold? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll give an example for that. As I was trying to figure out what was next after California Symphony, sort of the, the quote unquote traditional path would have been go lead another orchestra, add a zero to the budget and go lead another orchestra somewhere yeah. else. Mm -hmm. And I was getting called for those jobs and going through a lot of those interviews and, and some of them very far all the way. And every time I was thinking like, 
I mean, I had more clarity on my why then. Mm -hmm. And so it was more clear, like why that wasn't the right path. But that was part of the decision that led to me making this leap to consulting because I don't know, high school Aubrey or college Aubrey would have said, Aubrey, you could have been CEO of a bigger orchestra. There's that title, right? Exactly. There's the title. And it wasn't until now here I am in my late thirties realizing Aubrey, the title is not what's driving you. The title is not what's fulfilling. It's making an impact, changing a paradigm. Like I'm talking about an industry, Aubrey, and there's a better way to impact and affect change besides one organization. And so that was very key to me making the leap to doing the work that I'm doing now. And I would have never gotten that if I would have been thinking about yeah. title only. And Absolutely. so hopefully that example helps yeah. a little no, bit. That's, that's great. Aubrey, can you speak of, and not necessarily because you have it, but education and the importance for my listeners, regardless if it comes in the form of formal training or on the job training of which you're getting a lot of now? Mm-hmm. It is so important to want to better ourselves. So to what you just said, Brian, whether that's formal training or some sort of pursued, individually pursued training course growth, mm-hmm. that mindset I think is what's important. And mm-hmm. There are definitely jobs where they want to see a credential on the resume, undergrad degree or something like Mm -hmm. that. But I think, so that matters depending on on the type of job or type of field people want to go into. But I think aside from that type of requirement, this, this idea of I want to grow myself, I want to better myself is that's what is so much more important because we just learn so much more when we, or beyond school and and have that sort of mentality. And it's so important to um, getting the jobs we want, getting the advancement we want, but also when it's about bettering ourselves, there's a real internal reward for that too. And maybe that sounds cheesy, but I I believe that. (laughs) No, it's good. I mean, it allows you to engage in conversation. It allows you to experience what's going on in the world and, and maybe help other people in your community. All those aspects play a part in education. Mm-hmm. Aubrey Bergauer, how can people reach you? How can they get in touch with you? I'm on pretty much every social media channel at Aubrey Bergauer, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, come find me. I would love to connect with you there. Um, I have a website, AubreyBergauer.com, and all my blog posts are there as well if you want to read more about some of the things I spoke about. Two more questions. One, can you offer some words of encouragement for people? I mean, thinking of your career, if you've felt a little discouraged, inadequate, you weren't clear at some points, um, people feeling like that, or they've been trying to get a job and they're unable, they lost a job. Uh, But in the idea of work, any words of encouragement to people who just need that little boost? Mm just keep swimming. I think there are definitely so many days where it was, it was hard. And I, I mean, I tell us, I come on here and I tell a story and you all hear my successes. And I think there are definitely so many times where I thought, no, Aubrey, just keep swimming. And some, it's possible, I guess. That's the other thing. It's just to know that anything challenging or hard, it will pass time does continue to pass and we get to the other side of that and we have a choice on how we on how we will get to the other side of that do we continue growing and learning and in the midst of our challenges using that as a moment of am i going to wallow in this or am i going to dissect it and figure out what i can do differently or better or handle it or manage it differently um i believe in that using our challenges to to turn them into opportunities in that way so on the other side which there will be another side, it will be better and you will get there. Great. Aubrey, one final question. And this is the why. Why do you work? I work to change a paradigm. I think you're doing it. Thank you. I'm trying. (laughs) It's hard work, I'm sure. And it gets discouraging sometimes. I mean, it's a big paradigm to change, right? That's, that's, Mm -hmm. Uh, some heavy weight you're lifting there, but with tuba experience, you don't don't back down, keep on swimming. Aubrey Bergauer, I appreciate it. CEO of Changing the Narrative. You've been a great guest.
guest, and I hope you all the best in your endeavors with classical music and any other business that needs help changing. Love it. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.